Here we are, day three. We are in our misadventures. We're full in our misadventures. I love the the idea of miss with the quotation and uh, mar- uh, the uh, parentheses around it. Adventures. It's just kind of a fun play with words. And yeah, we are wandering through this story. We're getting to know a lot about Don Quixote. We've found out a lot about Don Quixote, and I am quite fascinated with this character. Have you read this whole set of, of stories? No, ma'am, I have not. I would like to. I, I guess it would have to be one translated because it is really, uh, I'm sure, originally in Spanish. They said yesterday that it was one of the first uh, modern European novels. It's also one of the most translated novels, I believe, in history. I read somewhere uh, just a little snippet of information there. Uh, absolutely. That doesn't surprise me. I'm sure you can find it in pretty much any language in the world because it is so famous. It's been around for so long and it's also referenced in so many things. I think if you read the book, you might notice references to Don Quixote in all sorts of ways and many other movies and stories and plays and even songs and things like that. The idea of, you know, we have the expression tilting at windmills. <laughs> oh, don't, you know, don't listen to that guy. He's always tilting at windmills. He's always chasing after sort of monsters or problems or things that don't really exist. Mm -hmm. So if you have a friend who's, you know, really passionate about the fact that Vladimir Putin is the worst president of Russia or, you know, something like that, you're like, yeah, okay, but what can we do about it? Why are you always going on about this? Why do you have a, you know, a thing about this certain person? You're always tilting at windmills. You're always going after things and trying to solve problems that you have no ability to solve or something like that. So, yes, there's definitely a lot of uh, influences, that being one of many. Um, And so we're going to find out more about the story. So this would be sort of literary criticism or literary analysis in today's article. It's going to be quite interesting. And so let's get into it. Let's do so. Let's listen to the article one time now. Despite being over 400 years old, Don Quixote continues to fascinate readers worldwide. The novel offers more than just amusing stories. Cervantes was inspired by the chivalric romances of his era, which typically depicted perfect knights rescuing damsels. However, he took a unique approach by creating a deeply moral yet comically incompetent main character, thereby challenging this familiar theme. Instead of adding another chivalric romance to the literary world, Cervantes aimed to satirize the genre, highlighting its overdramatic and foolish aspects. His talent for humor, complex plots, realistic dialogue, and vivid characters all contribute to bringing Quixote to life. At its core, the novel explores the clash of old and new values, reflecting the social and historical context of Cervantes's era. Don Quixote clings to old-fashioned chivalric codes, while the world around him moves beyond such ideals. Similarly, Cervantes urges contemporary writers to move beyond the superficiality of romantic fiction to craft stories with greater depth. Additionally, Don Quixote criticizes the class system, common in Spain at the time. The upper classes in the novel are depicted negatively. Sancho Panza, although of low social status, is portrayed as intelligent and thoughtful. Cervantes was progressive in suggesting that the upper classes were not inherently respectable or good. His emphasis on the differences between social classes and true value is a key reason why Don Quixote was viewed as revolutionary during its time. If you're ready to challenge your views on heroism, Don Quixote is an essential read. Begin this journey with the man from La Mancha and discover the profound truths hidden within his adventures. Here we go. We're getting into it. Despite being over 400 years old, Don Quixote continues to fascinate readers worldwide. Now, we're not talking about the character here. If you notice, it's in italics. That means the story itself, right? So that's the title of the, of the uh, story, and therefore we have it in italics so that we point it out. Otherwise, if it were written without the italics, then we'd be talking about the character. Um, but yeah, the character in the story does continue to fascinate us as well. And not just people in Spain and not just people here in Taiwan. It fascinates people worldwide, people who read the book worldwide. The novel offers more than just amusing stories. 
So it's not just something that makes you laugh, right? That absurd kind of, <laughs> this is hilarious, but it's also kind of sad. Um, it's not just something that, that makes you giggle. Um, Cervantes was inspired by the chivalric romances of his era, which typically depicted perfect knights rescuing damsels. And you can kind of get the sense of everything they've said so far that his focus in his stories are is really about uh, chivalry, right? I mean, he is. it seems like he really got into his reading about these chivalric and romances from his time frame. Again, Middle Ages, you've got Knights of the Round Table, things going around a few hundred years before, and it's probably very popular to hear these stories about about those knights, and it's very romantic. So chivalric romances would be, you know, romantic stories about about that period of time. Um, so somebody is falling in love, or somebody's rescuing somebody to keep them safe. And here it's the typically depicted perfect knights rescuing damsels. It's very romantic for for us to read. Depicted means to be written about or to be. If you think about it, it kind of sounds like to be pictured. To me, it's pictured through writing. If you're depicting somebody, you are describing them through writing with great detail so that it's almost like they are standing there like a picture of themselves where they come to life. Um, you can also depict the uh, a beautiful scenery and really kind of bring out uh, an amazing um, image of what that scenery looks like through your writing as you depict it. And these are perfect knights. They are these very chiv- uh, chivalrous knights rescuing damsels, damsels being young maidens in distress, young ladies in distress. Mm, absolutely, which, of course, is the heart of these kind of chivalric stories, knights uh, going off to, you know, save the day and rescue the girl. And, well, we have a lot of movies that still kind of have stories. <laughs> Pretty much exactly like that. I'm looking at you, James Bond. (laughs) However, it says he took a unique approach by creating a deeply moral yet comically incompetent main character, thereby challenging this familiar theme. So even before, well, no, actually not even before, I guess they did have these, you know, boring heroes. Well, not boring, but, you know, I mean, even today, right? Actors always say, oh, it's much better to play the bad guy than the good guy because the good guy is always good, always does the right thing. You always know what he's going to do. So it's a little bit dull. So Cervantes was kind of turning this on its head a little bit or looking at it from a, a slightly stranger angle. So he took a unique approach by creating a very, a very moral yet com- comically incompetent main character. This is sort of <laughs> like the, uh, the failed hero, you know, the guy who wants to be the hero, the guy who thinks he can be a hero, but he always messes it up in the end. He always ends up looking, uh, like looking silly rather than looking brave and noble. He's comically incompetent. If you're incompetent, you're really bad at whatever you're trying to do, basically. <laughs> So if you end up trying to make a sandwich and you cut your thumb and the tomato is, you know, uh, all different shapes and there's mustard leaking out of every corner of the sham- sandwich, I'd say that's an incompetent job. You did a bad, yeah, I could have made a sandwich in the dark with my, you know, with my eyes closed uh, better than you because it's really, really poor quality. It's a really poor performance. In this case, though, in the story, it doesn't lead to great, you know, disasters. It doesn't mean the bad guys win. It just means the good guy ends up looking foolish and silly, and that's where his friend Sancho Panza always has to kind of jump in to save the day and to save his face. I guess you can say he's helping him save face, because if you're comically incompetent, you would be looking kind of silly. Um, So this is challenging this familiar theme that heroes are always moral and good and right and strong and win in the end. Well, no, in the real world, of course, they don't. In, In fact, sometimes our heroes really shouldn't be heroes. They should just stay home and uh, take care of themselves. Instead of adding another chivalric romance to the literary world, Cervantes aimed to satirize the genre, highlighting its overdramatic and foolish aspects. It's kind of very modern in the same way that we make comedy movies today, Mm. making fun of spy movies or making fun of uh, superhero movies or something like that. Even a character like, um, what am I thinking, Deadpool. Oh, yeah. You know, that that Ryan Reynolds character, that's kind of subverting the heroic uh, superhero genre. It's satirizing the genre. It's kind of making fun of it, fun of it. It's highlighting the fact it's kind of pointing out and bringing attention to and, you know, laughing at 
the fact that it can, you know, superhero movies, Avengers movie, they can be great, but they can take themselves too seriously. The actors and the characters can be kind of wooden and, you know, one dimensional, you know, the good guys are good. The bad guys are bad, you know, that kind of thing. So he's kind of making fun and pointing out the overdramatic and the foolish aspects, the foolish parts of these heroic stories, right? Where the heroes always win. The damsels are always pretty and in distress and the monster always gets killed in the end. You know, these parts or these aspects of stories, he's kind of making fun of them, satirizing them. We would also say lampooning them. Mm. Um, and so it's, you know, bringing a slightly more realistic, slightly more cynical and sarcastic eye to these very traditional stories. A lot of times with people who are able to do this, it comes from having you know a wealth of knowledge about a particular area oh so for does, sure it does say that he was really into reading these chivalric romances during his you know younger years so he takes that and then he takes this he takes his talent for humor complex plots realistic dialogue and vivid characters and they all contribute to bringing quixote to life so he takes all of that background reading experience, all of that love of these kinds of stories and plays with it. And he's really playing with it. And that's a real art form. That's when you get into an elevated uh, skill level in, uh, in the writer, in the artist that is the writer. So that's really fascinating. He's also going to do more. He's going to get into a political look at things, which is curious as well. At its core, the novel explores the clash of old and new values, reflecting the social and historical context of Cervantes' era. So he, he says, at the, it says at the core, at the central part of this story, um, the whole reason for this story, it explores, it looks at the clash of old and new values, the battle between old and new. Here the clash is kind of like, well, they used to, you know, the, the, there were these old values but these new values are coming out and they're not, you know, in connection with the old. So they're kind of, you know, banging heads with it, kind of like that noise. And that's the clash right there. A lot of times you'll think of clash of swords. Your clothes can clash. If you're wearing, you know, stripes and, and dots, you might be made fun of because your outfit clashes. You have not chosen clothes that match in the right way. Here it's the values that are clashing and they're reflecting the social and historical world that Cervantes was in at the time. And, well, Don Quixote clings to his old-fashioned chivalric codes. He's trying to be this honorable knight in his mind while the world around him moves beyond such ideals. So the world around him is living maybe a more modern time and he's living in the old ways of doing things. But that's one part of it. And similarly, and in another way that's also quite similar, Cervantes urges contemporary writers to move beyond the superficiality of romance fiction to craft stories with greater depth. And that's really part of what's going on here. He's like, dude, these were the stories before. Yeah, we saved, we killed the dragon. We saved the girl. Everything's ha good and everybody's happy and they lived happily ever after. But wait, let's move a little bit further in today's world, our contemporary time, that's today, right? This general time now, contemporary time. He's telling those writers of that time to get, a, get beyond that, that basic level of a story and add more to it. Superficiality here means the surface level of something that is not very deep. It's quite shallow. Oftentimes when we talk about somebody being superficial, we talk about them seeming very shallow. They don't have a lot of depth to them. They don't have a lot of personality. They seem very fake. And that's what happens sometimes when something is too simple, like a story is too simple. It sounds very superficial. It sounds very fake. And he's saying, guys, today's writers, you need to come and step it up and do something more. Give more to your story. What more is it going to give? We'll look at that in a minute. But first, let's take a break and listen to our Chinese teacher. 听众朋友，大家好，我是安娜。我们从前天开始带大家看《唐吉诃德》这个故事。那么我们第一天的时候是看一下这个故事内容。那我们从昨天开始啊，就知道作者，然后还有作者为什么会创造出这么伟大的文学作品。不过其实真的是很厉害，因为《唐吉诃德》到现在已经有四百多年的历史。
，但是我们还是会把它奉为经典，有很多的读者。当然，这个小说。不是就是故事哦，很好笑啊 ，amusing 啊，哦，这个不是这样子的。这种肤浅的东西是不可能流传的，因为其实它里面的这个很多的主题啊，都非常的深刻，也是代表着很多的人性，还有对当时社会的批判。所以我们在第一段第三句，第一段第三句这个地方，这第三句啊，特别有提到说，作者塞万提斯因为受到当时骑士文学所启发。当然，骑士文学的那些作品通常是描绘这个完美骑士啊，拯救少女。可是他采取了是一种很独特的手法，他是用这个五十岁的唐吉诃德，虽然具有强烈道德感，但是很滑稽无能，用这种方式来做描绘。那我们特别要提到第一段第三句，这边是因为它有一个限定用法，它是有一个非限定用法补充说明的关系子句。好，我们先看一下先行词哦。先行词其实要谈的是 chivalric romances， the chivalric romances 就是所谓的呃这个骑士文学的的这样子的一个罗曼史。那后面的 of his era， 在他的当时是用来修饰前面的骑士文学这样子的罗曼史。所以逗点之后的会取要特别注意哦。它的先行词不是 era， 不是时代这个字，而是前面的 the chivalric romances。那最后面呢，在句尾的地方，我们还是要看一下，因为其实它是一个大包小的关系子句。虽然从汇取到句尾，我们看得出来就是一个补充说明的关系子句，可其实最后两个字的 rescuing damsels 这边也要左右挂号哎，因为它是修饰前面的 perfect knights。完美的骑士，什么样的骑士呢 ？Who 或者是 That rescue damsels， 它是官带省略，然后动词 rescue 变成动词 ing 的一个关系子句简化。那我们刚刚说作者用独特的手法啦，因为这个道德感虽然很强烈，但是唐吉诃德这个主角其实本身又有一点滑稽无能，所以挑战大家。对这个主题这种熟悉度，本来哎，本来不是应该是骑士吗？然后可能很有风范，那怎么会是唐吉诃德这五十岁老头儿那个样子呢？所以这个怪怪的。在第一段的接下来，我们看到第四句这个地方，第四句逗点之后啊，我们看到的是副词的 thereby， 因此 challenging 挑战了 this familiar thing 这个很熟悉的主题。那我们看到动词 ing 通常都是因为连接词的省略。如果说我们要去探讨的话，有可能是 and 的省略，或者是冠带简化 which 的简化。但是如果我们今天的目的是为了阅读的话，说真的，我们看到的英文的单字啊，这样子顺着中文这样下来，有没有？其实不太会影响我们的理解。不管在这边是 and 的省略，还是 which 带着关系子句的简化。从句子当中的 however 一直读到最后面逗点，因此挑战了这个熟悉的主题。所以接下来我们就看到，其实比起文学世界再添一个骑士文学作品，《唐吉诃德》的作者其实是要讽刺这样子的题材。接下来第五句最后面的这个讽刺 satirize 这个动词，就可以把它抓出来。其实他的目标就是要讽刺这种哦，骑士的罗曼史，拯救少女之类的。他要用这种过度戏剧化跟愚蠢这种方式来凸显所谓骑士文文学的另外一面。那当然，这个作者本身就很幽默啦，然后情节也很复杂，还有对话也非常的真实，人物刻画也很生动，所以让大家读起来觉得。唐吉诃德这个作品啊，真的是栩栩如生。在第一段最后面第六句这个地方，我们看到的“栩栩如生”这个片语可以抓出来 ，bring someone to life， 字面上是把什么什么复活了。如果把一个作品复苏、复活、给予生命的话，就表示这个作品栩栩如生。不过大家特别注意一下 ，contribute to something， 导致导致什么的结果呢？这里的 T O two 是个介系词哦，而因此影响到后面的 bring someone to life。这里的 bring 要用动词 I N G。
。好，接下来我们就来看一下这个唐吉诃德，基本上它的主题很多，所以除了探究新旧价值观的一种碰撞，其实也反映了当时的社会的时代啊、历史背景。因为唐吉诃德就一直要坚守这种很旧有的骑士之道。但是他周围的世界却又超越了这些理想，所以作者其实是希望他的作品能够敦促当代的作家突破浪漫小说的肤浅，一定要创作更深度的故事。我们在第二段，请注意一下第二句，第二句逗点之后的 while 是连接词，中文会翻成然而如何如何，就是要凸显出逗点前后子句。的状况对比对照，好，那最后面呢？我们提到的第三句，如果我们要创作更有深度的故事啊，创作刻画，当然创作我们可能会用 make create， 可是，在文章当中看到 craft 这个字，我们可以把它学起来哦。craft 本来有那种手工艺雕琢的意思，当我们把故事雕琢的更为有深度的时候，后面的 with。带的是工具，用更深的深度，用更广的深度来去 craft stories. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be right back. 好， l right, so we are back in here in our next paragraph. What more does he give? Additionally, Don Quixote criticizes the class system common in Spain at the time. So, a lot of societies have class systems historically,、um, where somebody of a lower level in society is a lower class level and will not have the benefits that someone of the upper class or the higher classes will have.、Um, sometimes you have,、uh, you know, the the poorest of the poor will be the lowest class and the The, the folks of no, levels of nobility, they will be the highest class, and he's criticizing that class system that was found in Spain overall at the time. It was common. If he's criticizing that in his work, it means that he's looking at the class system and he's saying this is problematic. I have problems with this. He's analyzing it and he's discussing the problems that he sees with it. But instead of discussing it. He has taken his art form and he's put it into his story. So the upper classes in the novel are depicted neg- negatively.、Um, so when he runs across the Duke and Duchess, probably they aren't the nicest of people. Maybe the upper classes that he sees in in this story, they they don't get to be the good characters. They are not depicted positively. They are depicted negatively. Sancho Panza, although of low social status. Is portrayed as intelligent and thoughtful. So Panza, the everyman, the basic、uh, lower class fella, he is actually given a character that has really more going for him. So he is portrayed or depicted as being intelligent and thoughtful. Thoughtful meaning full of thought,、um, thinking a lot about subjects in a deep way. So he's not just somebody who's like. Yes, we'll do this. He will be well. Maybe there will be some problems with this. We must go through the problems and analyze what could go wrong. That is someone who is thoughtful. Someone who is thinking. You can also be thoughtful if you're considerate or kind, and you do something for another person. You think of them, and you do something that you know they will like. You can give them a thoughtful gift, or、um, someone might say, "Oh, it's so thoughtful of you to give me these roses.、It's、so thoughtful of you to give me this card." All right, let's get back into it. it. Says Cervantes was progressive in suggesting that the upper classes were not inherently respectable or good. So here he is again, questioning, you know, the norms, the sort of assumptions of society at that time. He was kind of questioning if all heroes are really heroic, you know. And I think a lot of people, even then, would have known that, you know, the heroes, the knights, yeah, they might go around fighting wars and, you know, protecting the country occasionally. But knights at that time were also known to be kind of thugs.、Mm. They would go around stealing from people, raping women. They were not the heroes that they were often portrayed to be in the great stories of the time. He knew that. He was just one of the first people to actually kind of say it out loud or to write it in a story in a way that sort of communicated this idea and explored this idea when other people were afraid to. 
He was progressive. When we say someone's progressive, they're always trying to change things for the better. They're always trying to try new things and see if they work. Progressives can kind of push society forward and instigate change. That can be good. But sometimes some of the changes that they're, uh, you know, very passionate about making maybe are not quite ready yet. Maybe people aren't ready for them. Maybe these changes haven't been fully thought out, but they're definitely not satisfied with the status quo. They're trying to improve things, change things. They're the kind of break everything and see what happens tomorrow rather than when, oh no, don't touch that. We've been doing it that way for so long. We can't do it another way. Progressives would say, no, let's try another way. It might be better. So he was suggesting that the upper classes, that's the rich and powerful, lords, ladies, barons, counts, even the prince and the king and the queen and people like that, the upper classes were not inherently respectable or good. Just because you were born rich doesn't mean you were automatically better than other people. If something is inherently true, it is at its basic true, at its most, uh, you know, most simple form, it is true. It is inherently true that, uh, you know, children um, need their parents to take care of them, right? There might be a few situations where you have really independent young people, but it's inherently, it's basically true because of the nature of children not being wise and not being able to protect themselves. It's inherently true that kids need grown-ups to take care of them. Um, it's also not inherently true in this case that uh, rich people are respectable or good. Just because someone lives in a big house or has a fancy title in their name or their grandfather did some great noble deed doesn't mean that these people are automatically better than other people. They're not people you should automatically have to respect, right? You can be a rich and powerful person, but you can be a terrible liar. Someone who, you know, cheats on their wife all the time. Someone who, uh, you know, rips people off and steals money from people, even though those people are much poorer than them. Mm. That is not respectable. That's not someone who needs to be respected, even though they have millions of dollars and live in a big fancy apartment building or something like that. Um, so, you know, we should take people on what they do, not on who they are, is basically what he's saying there. His emphasis on the differences between social class and true value is a key reason why Don Quixote was viewed as revolutionary during its time. Oh. So looking at these differences between class, looking at these differences between someone's status and their true value, even though they're rich and powerful, are they a good person? Not necessarily. So it's a, a, it's a key reason. It's a very important thing to understand to show us why Don Quixote was viewed as revolutionary during its time and also it's still an important message today, right? I mean, right. a lot of people today will think, oh, if you're rich, you must be smart. But I think a lot of us, if we really look at the truth of that, no, you might just be rich because you were lucky. Now, that I find this all really fascinating because he's doing this through the context of uh, the character of Don Quixote, who is, you know, seeing things going on and isn't seeing it in the, in what it, for what it really is. So he sees the ladies at the inn as being young maidens and proper ladies when they're actually, I think, prostitutes. Mm. He's got just this complete illusion of what's really going on in the world. And that whole character that's created helps create that absurd that we've talked about and put it into the context of society at the time to allow you to really kind of think a lot more. And that, that desire to make people think that's something that came out in later writers like Alexander Pope or Jonathan Swift. Um, mm. My dad wrote his dissertation, actually, on Don Jonathan Swift um, with his Gulliver's Travels and a Modest Proposal, where Modest Proposal, uh, Jonathan Swift is basically saying, well, let's, if we're, we're going through a hunger period, uh, famine, let, let's eat our babies. It's perfectly fine. And he was writing the way he wrote to disturb people and make them think and make them have an opinion about uh, what was going on around them. And it sounds like Cervantes was really kind of the grandfather of this. He was doing this as well. Um, and quite, quite fascinating. Also, his character in the story, uh, Don Quixote, at the end, I think he goes to sleep one day and he wakes up and he's back to being his original person. He ah. is uh, Quiano again. He doesn't really think the world is what it was before. So they make this all kind of this almost like this dream world mm. story, which is also quite fascinating and makes me think of the Wizard of Oz and how the yeah. Wizard of Oz 
story uh, was was put together in movie form. Uh, next paragraph, final paragraph says, if you're ready to challenge your views on heroism, Don Quixote is an essential read. So if you're ready to challenge what you think a hero is, is it is it the guy who's wearing the S on his shirt and doing good things? Or is it the fellow who's out chasing windmills thinking they're they're uh, giants? Uh, which one is it? Are you going to to to? you know, challenge yourself by looking at heroism in a different way. Is the good guy the upper class because they have money? Or is the good guy the 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 fellow who rides the donkey and is thoughtful? Um, and if you have the desire to think about this a little more deeply, then Don Quixote is an, ins- an essential read, something you absolutely have to read. Uh, begin this journey with the man from La Mancha and discover the profound truths hidden within his adventures. So the man from La Mancha is, of course, Don Quixote. He's from La Mancha, but it's also a play, play on on a play. <laughs> There's a musical called Man from La Mancha. There's also movies out called Man from La Mancha. So um, our writer is kind of playing on words here. So start your journey with the man from La Mancha and discover the profound, the deep, the really deep truths hidden within his adventures. We hope you get the chance to do this, but maybe you're going to have to do it after we listen to our Chinese teacher one more time. 最后面呢，我们在文文章当中就提到另外一个主题，就是有关于唐吉诃德这个作品批判当时西班牙的一种阶级制度。那这个阶级啊，真的就是那个 class 的这个意思。所以第一段的第三段的第一句啊，我们看到那个阶级制度哦 ，the class system， 可以把它抓出来。当时这个阶级制度，好像上层的社会就是好像比较高贵啦，然后社会低层好像就比较不好啦。可小说当中不一样哦，在小说当中，上层社会被负面的描写，而出身很低的桑丘，也就是唐吉诃德的 squire， 却被描绘成为很聪明，而且非常周到。那当然，这个作者就是要暗示上层社会并不是天生崇高。或者是善良，我们来看一下第三段第四句。第四句啊，作者之后，我们看到动词 was progressive in something， 这边可以抓出来，因为 progressive 它就有很激进的意思，所以它是很激进的、很前卫的 suggest， 它是暗示着 the upper class， the upper classes 上流的社会，并不是天生好像就非常的 respectable。非常的好，所以他也强调了这种社会阶级啊跟实际价值之间的这种差异。那么在这个作者当中，这个这这个作品当中，其实这种主题算是一种很革命性的主题哦。所以在第三段的第五句也告诉我们，这样子的一个状况啊，是一个 key reason， 因为要把所谓的当时的社会阶级还有真正的价值观抓出来做一个对比对照。这就是为什么当时就是会觉得是一个 revolutionary 一种革命性的作品，是一个很关键的因素。所以你会发现，唐吉诃德好像感觉上是一个很有趣的小说，很好笑。但是他其实也讽刺了很多的主题，比如说阶级制度啦，或者是探讨当时新旧价值观的碰撞。如果你也觉得对这个作品很有兴趣的话，或许也可以找时间好好读一读哦。以上就是我们今天内容。我是安娜，我们下次见。Don't go chasing windmills, Mike. Don't do it. Don't、uh, go chasing windmills. I won't go chasing windmills or waterfalls. Or waterfalls. Yes, but I might actually try to find this book. I think it's maybe time to read it. And now you that we being know the well-read、so、person you are. Sorry, you, I'm sorry. You being the well-read person you are.、I'm、well, that's、sure. true. Now I guess I'm not that well-read. I haven't read Don Quixote yet, so、oh, I'll have to add it to the、read. list. <laughs> we got to get in there and read it. I'd like to read it too, but finding the time to Delve into the novel and its profound meanings might take me a while. All right, everybody. For English Digest, I'm Leah, and I'm Mike. Take care.